God shows up and we discover his risen presence in our midst and our act of worship takes on depth of meaning because we travel together along the road of faith. Amen. Amen? Amen? Okay, some of you are saying amen. I guess some of you are struggling. That's okay. We're here to struggle alongside one another in faith. Aha. Uh -huh. The fuse group are now going upstairs. Okay. Could somebody shut the door at the back? I think they've all gone. Thank you. Okay. I want us to think this morning together about silence. Is there room in our lives for silence? How much room is there left in our room for silence? We are the victims of urban noise, mobiles, music playing stuff going on around us all the time. We are the victims of urban noise around us. The ancient peoples of this planet feared darkness and feared the forces of nature, earthquake, wind and fire. But I put it to you this morning that what we urban people fear is silence. We deal with the darkness by flicking a switch. We deal with the silence, which we find hard to cope with, by turning on an electronic device, television, mobile, radio, something, to fill the silence. What is silence? Most of this universe is silent outer space before creation was brought into being Genesis 1 there was silence silence can be a terrifying place as the psalmist puts it unless the Lord had given me help I would have dwelt in the silence of death confronting silence Entering into silence gets us close to death and the absence of life because in the grave it is silent. The absence of sound we sometimes experience as being a kind of death, a kind of bringing to, to, to birth in us a kind of primordial fear. There is for some of us also the fear that if we enter into silence, our thoughts will overwhelm us and our demons will rise up within us and, and kind of consume us. So at all costs, turn on the mobile phone, turn on the radio, have the television set playing 24-7, and, and, and we won't have to confront our primordial fears and we, won't have to, we can keep those dark voices in our heads at bay. Entering into silence, therefore, is a willingness to confront these fears head on. And I think, first of all, of Jesus. Having shared the Last Supper with his friends, goes out, the scripture tells us, into the night and into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And there, in that dark, garden in Jerusalem. He prays alone because Peter, James, and John hadn't got the strength to stay with him in prayer. So he prays and in silence confronts what he knows is coming his way. I think of Elijah, who having probably had what today we would call a kind of nervous breakdown, 
through being hounded as the last prophet in the land by his opponents and fed in the wilderness by ravens, finally finds himself on the Mount Horeb, on the Mount of the Lord. And there he is, there's a wind and there's an earthquake and there's a fire. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came the sound of pure silence as I'm told by the scholars, the true underlying meaning of the Hebrew is the sound of pure silence. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mount of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Elijah, when he reaches the point of silence, finally hears the voice of the Lord who shows him the way forward when all other ways forward seem to have run into the sand. Notice that both Jesus in Gethsemane and Elijah on Mount Horeb are facing possible violent death. And they face it in silence. For Jesus, his path is towards the cross and to death. And that silence in the garden is where he receives the strength to say, not my way, but your way, O Lord. Your will be done. And again, Elijah on the mountain of Horeb knowing he could be killed at any moment, has the courage out of that time of silence to know the way forward and to hear the voice of the Lord. The Christian tradition, and we're not very good at this, but the tradition, Christian tradition honors silence. If you go right back to the early centuries and to Antony, St. Antony of the desert, here was a man who was so overwhelmed by the urban noise all around him okay, in Egypt, so overwhelmed by the, the sin and the, the corruption, the prostitution, the alcoholism, the political feuds that were going on all around him. He felt so overwhelmed by all of that that he felt the only thing he could do was leave the urban noise and go out into the wilderness. And Antony, so the tradition tells us, stayed in the desert for, I don't know how many years it was. Does anybody know? I think it was about 25 years or so. He went out as a young man, something like that. Went out for many, many years into the desert because he wanted to hear the voice of the Lord in the midst of silence. A silence he'd consciously chosen to embrace, knowing that there in the silence he would have to confront his own demons. All the voices within him, all the temptations of being a young man alone. And he hacked it. He kept going and going and going. And then, many years later, people from the cities around of Egypt, Cairo, I suppose, is what, places like that, came out of the cities to Antony because they wanted to get spiritual direction in their lives. And they recognized when they met him that here was a man who had found in silence how to hear the voice of the Lord. So they came to him for spiritual direction. Great, the great and the good, the, the, the political leaders of the day, came to Antony to hear direction for their lives and discover God's hand in their lives. 
Silence played a vital role in that. We speak of carving out silence to wait on God. Carving out silence to wait for him to speak. To discover that actually the gap between heaven and earth is thin. Though we have made the gap between heaven and earth very, very wide through all our noise and all our activities. In the book of Revelation, there's a wonderful moment where silence comes. The Lamb of God, Jesus, is given the right to open seven seals. Only he has the power to open the seven seals because he is the Lamb of God who is willing to go to the cross for us all. Because of his willingness to die for us, he is given the power and the authority to open the seals. And there are seven of them. And when it comes to chapter 8, here we in verse 1, we read this. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Silence. Right up to that point, there had been tumultuous activity. Now the final moment of truth has come, and with it, silence in heaven for half an hour. There had been the persecutions of the faithful ones, the Christians who were being thrown to the lions. There had been the supplication of the saints, the martyrs, praying, how much longer, God, is this going to go on? And then the seventh seal is opened, and there is half an hour of silence in heaven. Almost as though the prayers of the saints, which are like um, incense rising from hot coals to heaven, almost as though it's going to take half an hour for all those prayers, how much longer, Lord, are we going to be persecuted? those prayers to rise to heaven and be heard. And when heaven hears, judgment follows. Judgment is to follow. Have any of you been to see the film Twelve Years a Slave? Anybody been to see that? One or two of you. On in Luton at the moment. In this film, we follow the story of one black man in America who is uh, kidnapped along with other black people and taken by white um, slave drivers into a cotton picking farm. And they are forced into labor with great brutality. The film unfolds very slowly with lots of points where you can, as it were, meditate on what's actually happening. And there comes a point when one very beautiful young black girl who happens to be the most effective cotton picker in the whole team, she picks far more cotton every day as it's weighed on the scales at the end of the day by the white man, she picks far more than any of the others. She's an absolute gem in the slave driver's team. And there comes a point when she comes back to the farm with a bar of soap in her hands. And the slave driver, the master of the house, says, what are you doing with that bar of soap in your hands? Where did you get that? And she says, I went to get it in the other place down the road because when I smell, when I breathe, when I smell, the the smell of my own body odor is so overwhelming that it makes me gag. So I needed this bar of soap to wash myself. And the white man is enraged that she did this. 
and left and came back with soap. So she orders the hero of the story, the black man, next to her to, to whip her, to scourge her with a huge whip. So the black man ties her to the tree. She take, has to take all her clothes off. She's tied to the tree, and he starts to whip her. The wife of the tr slave driver comes out of her house, and she watches with great delight as this is going on because she's jealous. She knows her husband is in love with the black girl. In fact, he's been raping. And there comes a point where the black man stops scourging the girl tied to the tree and the white slave owner takes the whip and continues with great violence and, and evil to, to beat her until she drops and probably is in, within inches of her life. And then in this, the film... The music stops, and there is silence. A very necessary silence. Because the evil of the moment, and the absolute horrific injustice of it all, has to be laid hold of we cannot rush on to the next scene. We have to stay there with it. And I'm reminded of those words in Genesis after Cain had slain Abel and the Lord God says to him, what you have done, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Silence. Abel is dead. Cain has slain him. Silence is everywhere. But a voice is crying. The voice of the injustice, of the sin, of the evil is crying out. The blood is crying out from the ground. Sometimes the only response to injustice is silence. Nelson Mandela's 27 years of silence in his cell in solitary confinement. A space in which God then speaks. I do believe that to deepen our worship, we need to become comfortable and at ease with silence. And I'm not talking about silence uh, where we don't quite know what to do. I'm talking about a silence which is filled with a holy anticipation. A silence that comes because no words will be adequate to capture what is happening. A necessary silence. Not an embarrassing silence when we think the worship leader might have run out of songs or we think the techie can't find the words in the computer, or we can't manage to come up with another song, and we all get rather twitchy and embarrassed, or we think because the vicar hasn't planned the service adequately and produced a sheet of paper telling us what's happened next, or that kind of silence when we think, when we think, well, it's probably going to be Jimmy that prays next. And I'm already angry that it's going to be him that prays next. I'm talking about a silence. Which is a genuine, authentic, waiting on God. A pregnant silence. It was 31 years ago this day that Mar at Margareta and my daughter Rebecca was born in the Queen Mother's Hospital in Glasgow. And I shall never forget the day when we came out of the, the hospital nine months earlier and 
I had just seen this scan. And I seen this little daughter waving her hand from Margareta's womb. And I was looking over Glasgow, and it was silent. And into that silence, God said, I am. We celebrate her birthday today, 31 years later. So silence as a gift and not a primordial fear. Silence which is not something just leading to death in the grave. But silence which is waiting on a God who wants to speak, but we need to be silent if we're going to hear his voice. We speak in English of falling silence. Falling silence. Are you comfortable with this? Or is it threatening? I want my mobile quick. Can't cope with this. Give me a computer screen. Turn the radio on. Quick, Josh, sing another song. Don't escape from the silence. I had the picture the other day of worship being like a group of people stalking a deer in the forest. I shared this last week. Do you remember? See, I've only got two ears, two eyes, one heart. I'm stalking the deer. I'm looking for the presence of the risen Lord Jesus. But I'm very weak and frail. But together with you, all of you, if we stalk the deer together, it may well be you who sees him for me. And we need to stalk in silence. Because if we make a big noise, we might frighten him off. And when one spots him, it could be all the other saints. And the scriptures make it very clear to us that it is probably the meek and the lowly who are most likely to spot the deer, spot the lamb, spot the presence of the ridden, risen Lord Jesus. Sixty eyes, however many we are this morning, sixty eyes are better than one set of eyes. 60 are better, but we have to do this together, all of us together. The stalking of the deer doesn't work if one goes off and takes his mobile phone or another group goes and have a chat or another one's filled with resentment that something's not happening they think ought to be happening. No, together we have to wait on the Lord. A spirit of resentment can subvert this collective Search for the presence of the Lord. We have to do this wholeheartedly as one community of faith waiting. A holy, pregnant silence. God chose, chooses the lowly to shame the wise. So if you are sitting here thinking it couldn't possibly be me, I'm too unholy. I'm not that person. If you're sitting here thinking I'm not as big a spiritual giant as our Jimmy, then beware. It probably is you. God chooses the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He chooses the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. So Paul writes to the Corinthian church, chapter 1, verse and, uh, 1 Corinthians 1. We gather 9 o'clock every Sunday morning here in this space for an hour. We have no agenda other than the agenda of waiting on the Lord. We wait 
to speak. We have to let go of any embarrassment, any impatience, any fidgetiness. We have to wait for him to speak. And he does speak. In my little book here, since we started this, is now about actually that many pages full of things he's spoken through different people. This morning he said this. Jesus was on the cross. We saw him on the cross. Then we saw his disciples and Joseph of Arimathea come and take him down from the cross. And we saw the sun rising in the east very slowly. And we're reminded that the bridegroom comes out of his tent, so the psalmist tells us, like a sun rising in the east. And this is Jesus rising, his resurrection. And as Jesus rises and as the sun rises in the east over the land... So this picture developed. People of evil intent who had been hiding in the darkness of their ways suddenly find themselves brought into, exposed in the light of the day. And what they had been doing is exposed and brought into the light. Whilst those who had been hiding in the darkness, fearful, are coming out of their houses and tents and rejoicing in the the presence of the risen Lord Jesus as his bright, radiant light shines over them. So judgment, the thoughts of the many will be revealed. Evil will be exposed for what it is as the sun rises over the land. That was one of the pictures. There were others. That was one that we had this morning. Let's wait in silence for a moment now. How do you do this? First of all, just start to listen to the silence. Pages being turned. Bushmead is a quiet place. No cars. Can you hear your own breathing? Get in touch with the sound of your breathing. You may be able to hear the breathing of the person either side of you. those natural sounds that make us human. If you're feeling twitchy and uncomfortable, get in touch with that and find a more comfortable position. It takes time to do this. Probably you'll start to be thinking of all the things that you ought to be doing later today and have forgotten to do. That's okay. That's human. Make a note of them. And then lay them all to one side. And as you come through the more superficial but maybe important things, you come to the deeper things. Maybe God lays on your heart a certain person You see their face. You hold them before God. And in the silence, you wait on the Lord. Maybe anger comes up, bubbling up within you towards something or other. 
may be a perfectly justifiable anger. It may be a righteous anger. But get hold of it. Lay it before God. Ask him to help you discern what is of him and what is not of him. Imagine Jesus opening the seventh seal and silence coming in heaven for half an hour before the judgment comes. Do you know the, the clock in this space fell down the other day? I think maybe a ball hit it or something, and it's broken into many pieces. My first thought was, how did that happen? We need to get a new clock. But I'm now thinking, what is God saying to us through that? We let go of the Chronos time at the ticks of the of the clock and we wait on the Lord until he speaks and his will is that we become of one heart and one mind with each other that he reveals his thoughts to us and we discern them together and then we know the way of the Lord forward. And wherever there may be disunity, we pray that it is brought to light. To the bright, radiant, shining light of the risen Son of God. And wherever there are thoughts that are negative and corrosive of community life we lay them before the foot of the cross and we say oh the blood of Jesus it washes whiter than snow and it is in the silence often that the darker things are brought into the light to be revealed for what they are exposed dealt with And as we then hear the voice of the Spirit, peace comes. And it can even be joy within the midst of terrible suffering. And God, through Jesus, fulfills his promise to build his church We know that even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 